Uh, I'm Yusuf. Uh, I'm a uh, product manager for uh, Stackstrom, and we have, you know, you'll see, you know, quite our team is here. And I'm going to talk to you about the networking aspect uh, of uh, bringing automation to networks. So just a, you know, just a quick, you know, context around a few things, right, to, to kind of dive into the demo, because we don't have a lot of time. And one thing I want to highlight is that, obviously, as Dimitri talked about the platform itself, that, you know, we will keep on building, Dimitri's team will build it for, obviously, you know, driving the community effort, which is extremely critical. As well as, uh, you know, within Brocade, we will take a crack at the networking vertical. We want to actually, you know, go deep into the networking side and, you know, basically create automation. And I'm going to talk to you about that. Uh, also, uh, you know, just to give you some background, when I when we talk about network automation, the for the agenda today, we will be cover. You know, I'll be showing you a demo of how to uh, provision an IP fabric. So that's our first use case. I would say that's our first step actually to kind of, you know, start looking into the. Uh, automation of a network lifecycle. And when I talk about lifecycle, I talk about starting from provisioning, then, you know, looking into some harder problems like validation, troubleshooting, and then, you know, remediation as much as possible. So obviously it's a, it's a big plate, you know, that, you know, we have to address. And uh, uh, we're starting with, you know, provisioning first. And from a provisioning perspective, uh, as I will show you in the demo, uh, some of the sensors that we will, you know, we are thinking about, number one, when you're doing provisioning, it's basically a user-triggered provisioning. I set up my fabric. I want to start provisioning it. So, you know, I could use a CLI, as Dimitri showed, or, or the stacks from UI. Uh, moving forward, we're going to add other types of uh, sensors as well, such as integration with syslog or SNMP or SFlow, so that, that those capabilities will get richer over time. So from an architectural perspective, uh, just uh, quickly, uh, so, you know, you have Stackstorm as a platform or Brocade Workflow Composer as a platform, but then you also have these workflows. And uh, as we talk to our customers, really what gives them the agility is having these workflows uh, either provided by Brocade or, you know, tweaked by our customers so they could buy a workflow. And, you know, we, uh, we refer to them as automation packs and some of our terminology, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see more and more of that. And we want to focus them around use cases, so a data center use case, you know, a, a, an internet exchange provider use case, and so on. So this, this content is the one that actually gives agility to our customers. And they can use the, you know, turnkey type provided by workflow, by Brocade. They can customize them. So we, you know, you'll also hear about services, uh, a type of capa capabilities from Brocade to A, install this platform in our customers, B, just build workflows for them, or C, you know, learn them, teach them how to fish, you know. Uh, so the workflows could also be built by our customers, like what Dimitri showed you that the community is building, right, from simple ones to the exotic ones. Uh, then you have the, uh, you know, the user interfaces. So as you saw, uh, you know, you saw the uh, flow UI or, or what we are calling as a design UI. Uh, you know, you saw some of the uh, UI of the platform. Uh, you know, you saw the CLI, and then you can also call workflows from chat ops. So today I'll be focusing mainly on the UI and the CLI aspect, given the time. And then you have basically the platform with a set of composable services. So, you know, things like audit, things like LDAP, RBAC, you know, for enterprise, the workflow engine itself, data store, inventory, device rules, and so on. And some of these things, you know, as we look at the network, we are actually giving a hard look into how we build the network inventory, how we do other things, right? So a lot of the a lot of these are basically starting points for us where we actually want to take them forward. And then you have the platform itself, uh, you know, on with uh, with a message bus, an extensible microservices platform, and then the sensors and actions, which basically tie into all of these different domains, as Dimitri showed in his presentation. And so, from a brocade perspective, the sensors and actions. As I said, today when I, look, when I show you the provisioning demo, it will be triggered by a user, either by CLI or by uh, you know, the interface. But then moving forward, syslog, SNMP, SFlow, those type of sensors will start coming in, more from an event-driven perspective. With, go ahead, you had a question? No, 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 I didn't mean to interrupt. Everything south of the message bus you're saying is the open source 
uh, StackStorm product, basically. And you've added everything on top of that. So this is the StackStorm product, uh -huh. uh, uh, the platform itself. The, the workflows are basically the content which Brocade you know, produces or open source community rights or, you know, we may have partners or our own professional services tweaking gotcha. or building those, right? So most the, of this is still the open source. You, what you've done is you've added um, the ability to come up with workflows in a much more, um, I guess, simplistic way. Uh, yes, and, and, and provide the content because what our customers need, so if you comp contrast, take OpenStack, for example. Yeah. You know, I can download a platform, but it takes me as a customer six months to a year to figure out how to break it into my environment, how to really build something, you know? So with a platform like StackStorm, and with the content being provided by Brocade, as I'll walk you through a workflow, a demo, that demo we, we're gonna give you, and so you could see how you could build a data center fabric, the one that we call an IP fabric, in under 15 minutes. Otherwise, it's a lot of you know, hit and miss around, okay, IP connectivity, do I know BGP, do I know BGP, EVPN, and so on. So that's sort of uh, the idea. Now the platform itself, obviously 90% of BWC and StackStorm is the common base. Some of the things which are different are around enterprise bits or brocade support, right? As is the case with any modern software platform. The integration points are essentially the, uh, the integration packs as Dimitri showed you on the StackStorm website. So just like you saw somebody write an uh, integration pack for FireEye, we actually you know, are gonna start providing those packs for brocade moving forward. So that's, 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 that's the thing. And one of the packs, so, so one of the packs that I'm, you know, we're going to cover today is basically around our VDX platform. So the demo is for an IP fabric that is comprised of VDX switches. So uh, it runs the NOS operating system. So we've actually written, uh, you know, there's a PyNOS library that runs, it's a, it's a Python library. It's a, it's a netconf, think of it as a netconf interpreter, uh, you know. So as you, as you basically want to, uh, you know, fire off commands to, you know, from StackStorm based on these workflows, the, uh, you know, the PyNOS library actually goes to the switches and, you know, leveraging the Yang model, leveraging netconf starts to basically push those configurations that, you know, you want to build around the content you have. Do you have any libraries for that published? So PyNOS, uh, PyNOS will be basically our, is our kind of the <laughs> integration point to brocade VDX switches, so that we're going to publish along with the platform starting in September. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay, so that's your Python okay. library for yeah. Yeah. on on box stuff. Okay, cool. So from a vision perspective, we want to, as I said, we want to, you know, not only just provision, uh, you know, our networks, but we want to actually capture the entire life cycle. Because when you think about a service, it's composed of creating a service, the whole CRUD life cycle around it. And obviously, uh, as I get into more details, for us it's a journey. So you will see provisioning today, but obviously when people build a data center fabric, we also want to basically provide integration with a northbound hookup point. Will people hook it up with a VMware? Will they hook, up, hook it up with an open stack? Is it a multi-tenant fabric, or is it you know, being run for bare metal as a service like Hadoop and so on? So those are all the sorts of different things that we are thinking through. But the demo today will be very contained around how do I provision an IP fabric, uh, you know, which is based on layer three connectivity, which is based on BGP, VPN, and how do I do with automation, essentially. So uh, just some, um, you know, some details around it. So uh, the, way we, the, way our IP, you know, the way our VDX platform works and the NOS uh, you know, operating system on that works is that there is a DAT process, essentially it builds a view of what would be some of the parameters of the fabric, right? And uh, so what we are doing in this demo is we are picking up all of those things using a, basically a Python script and auto-populating a database in StackStorm. And then as a switch is added, workflow is, uh, a workflow is run which identifies, you know, what is the, what is the you know, template of this fabric, what is the role of this switch and so on. So we'll go in some of those details. And when all of these switches are configured, you have a fully functioning IP fabric that comes up. You know? And then moving forward, we also want to basically enrich it with validation capabilities, rollback, and so on. But those are things which will come you know, down the line in our journey. From the, uh, before I run into the demo, I just want to show a few things so that you, know, you have some context in terms of what's happening. So we have a, a three-stage um, IP fabric running layer three, uh, basically. So each switch is in its own AS. You know, you have 
two leaf switches which are running in a VLAG mode for high availability. And uh, the way the way this is this all is, is works is so you know when I run the when I start the demo, basically I discover the inventory. What are the switches? I get some basic parameters from the DAT process, which are already populated in the database. Uh, uh, the switch roles are discovered based on connectivity. You know how how the fabric is uh, is connected, and basically what's happening is I create a template. In in my demo, I'm going to call this template a default template, and so there are different parameters such as IP address range. If it's an you know if it's an IP numbered addressing or Basically, there are different parameters for unnumbered. So pretty much, you know, your usual IP fabric type parameters. Uh, you know, AS range for the spine, AS range for the leaf, and then other miscellaneous parameters. And I'll show you a sample demo of the CLI. Uh, because my demo took about 15 minutes, I'm going to walk you through a recorded version, just you know, for, from a timing perspective, and kind of emphasize on key points uh, here. And the key point is that you know, so you have a template with all these parameters. You have an inventory service that discovers which switches are added, and then you run the workflows on those switches. So in some sense, you know, the fabric template and the physical uh, switches are initially decoupled, and then you, know, you can push that, you know, the template of that fabric on those switches. And I think that's a powerful concept, because what we're seeing in the industry is that the, uh, the service definitions and the actual physical layer or the physical transport are kind of getting decoupled. So it's, so it's powerful from that perspective. So, uh, you know, you, you, you can see all of these details in the, in the uh, you know, on, online user manual or, you know, it's all available on the web. Essentially, if you really want to uh, configure a fabric template, you can create one like what Dimitri was showing with, you know, all of the different ST2 commands. Uh, if you want to provision a fabric with the default parameters, and I'll, I'll show you those, you can actually look at those default parameters for a fabric. You can keep on adding different switches. And the way these commands work is, so ST2 run is pretty much you know, like the, the, you know, the initial parser. But then you have key value pairs. And you can put these key value pairs in any order. So essentially, this is the, this is the switch. This is the fabric template that it's being associated to. This is the username and password, uh, you know, the key value pairs. So seven of these switches are being added. And when they are all added to the inventory, then this command, st2 run nos configure fabric, this ties the inventory to the default fabric template. And that's how you know, this works. Uh, when, we, when we ran it, it takes about somewhere around six to 700 seconds, so about 10 minutes plus to you know, finish, off, finish this big workflow. So the value that I see in Stackstorm primarily is uh, the event-driven nature of it, right? Where yes. most other tools, they tend to require a lot of human initiation. Um, this slide, I don't see anything diff. I don't see the value of, S, uh, of Stackstorm in this, just because everything is still, I think, a little manual. Would it not be better to um, use Stackstorm to see what switches come up and sort of pull them automatically? Absolutely. Just manually say, you know, here's this switch. This is, a, this is its IP address. Right. And, and, you're, and you're right. So eventually, so, and, and you bring up a good point. Eventually, let's say if we want to have a northbound API, which ties it to, let's say, an OpenStack or a VMware system, where somebody says, go and build me a fabric, which is how people build clouds and data centers today. And you know, we, we, we plan to provide some of those things from a northbound perspective. Plus, to your point about IP addressing, yes, this is from a demo perspective, but having IPAM integration into either some customer's Excel file, you know, which a lot of our customers use, or something like InfoBlocks, we are looking into that. The challenge or the thing to keep in mind from an automation perspective is, you want to integrate wherever possible without reinventing the wheel. And so those are things for what we want to do. But keep in mind the challenge when you're coming out with the first releases. If you try to do too much, it you know, takes forever to do. So, so, so you're aware of that journey. So step by step, you'll see us you know, having uh, basically API-based triggers to provision a fabric, discover IPAM, discover you know, the DAT process, where I'm actually inputting these parameters you know, getting serial numbers of the switch. If you can automate this and I just make it more plug and play, just like our VCS fabric, yes, yeah. you know, we, we plan to do that. Yeah, I think I, the only reason I really bring it up is because there's, there's a lot of overhead associated with um, um, adding capacity in any yeah. part of the infrastructure. 
Um, and actually, greenfield becomes less of a problem because every sort, everyone sort of understands that that overhead is there. Where you really want to make that optimization is brownfield, where you're adding capacity to existing infrastructure because then you know, it's just sort of expected that it, that it can expand easily. And the fewer of these steps that I have, that, the smaller that overhead is. And, uh, and you'll realize that efficiency over time. Absolutely. But I think brownfield's more important from this perspective. Yep. Part of that is Brocator expertise that is within the workflow. And part of that is flexibility that's end to the, uh, like left to the end user because which event triggers an addition? See, we, like, there is a number of ways where you can set up the rule and define an event that fires deployment of the IP fabric when the new switch comes up. You might have your own inventory system. You might have the script on the switch that you know, generates such an event. But, and this is the thing which is very custom and changes from customer to customer. While the structure, the process of deploying the IP fabric is brocade knowledge, and right now it's you know, taken into this workflow, and now you have that and you run that, on your terms based on your rules that you define and your triggers that you define. So it could be as simple as adding rules that watch those IP addresses by exactly. pinging them and then as soon as one comes up, uh, basically run that command but you know, it embedded into the yeah. text. Exactly. <laughs> and the flexibility is what separates text term from kind of the closed solutions where, yeah, here is the way we deploy the IP fabric and now you take your last mile and do that your way. And I think also, I, I also think that this is also illustrative of just that demo you want to show. Because oh, if I sure. yeah, if yeah. I started running all these commands, yeah. I mean, you know, as you will see, you know, we will start with CLI and we will switch over to UI. And to the point about, you know, discovering a switch, I mean, really, if you look at the DAT process, it, you know, you're tying it to serial number. So, you know, the whole idea is like, you know, uh, you open a box, it's a remote site, you have somebody with no skills, you plugs it in, if the serial number gets picked up, you know, just like how almost every other vendor is doing remote management, you know, that's, I think, where we want to go. So essentially, we are thinking about that, but from a demo and from an initial release perspective, we want to keep it simple, and I understand your point. I mean, it's, you know, greenfield may be easier, but brownfield tends to be complicated. Yeah. But the fact that we are building a 15, uh, sorry, a seven switch fabric fully functioning with, with IP, with BGP, all, you know, EVPN and all of that, and under 15 minutes, I think is powerful enough because when you look at the major challenge that you know, we've seen with our customers is like, how do I become agile with offering a service? And how do I keep things simple and my you know, sort of OPEX maintained, which is everybody's challenge with that. Plus to add to that point, brocade switches have a Python interpreter on, at least the NOS switches have it. So you can always write scripts on the switch to ping back to uh, sure. Stackstorm platform. Yeah, sure, all of, that's a po all of that's possible. It wasn't really a shortcoming of the technology, more of a, a process kind of thing. Is it better for me to instruct my engineers to go through this step, then go through this step, then go through this yeah. step, or bake it into my process that's yeah, been so version controlled? Most of the sequences that you saw there could be automated very easily. Yeah. Uh, we have written up scripts to do that. Process. Right, and I, and I think part of that as well, I mean, okay, speaking personally, I don't deploy fabrics all the time. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in the 80% rule, right, which is where I'm going to spend most of my time writing scripts and automating things that take up 80% of my day, yeah. right? I, I deploy a new fabric once every year, if that. So as a proof of concept, yay. To me, there's an interest, though, tying in with the event thing of I have a fabric, I add two more leaf nodes, and the event becomes new LLDP neighbor, and then I trigger integrating those in automatically. Now, that's interesting to me, yeah, right, yeah. as an extension of that. Or, to your point, something comes up on a remote site, and we trigger, that's the event we're triggering on, and we're going to get the configuration in. So, uh, roam the, we'll roam, uh, as a proof of concept, it's fine. I, Absolutely. I just, and, 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 you know, I, I, I wanted to keep it very tactical because, you know, intentionally we didn't want to get into uh, capabilities that we don't have. So I have a slide and you know, uh, any of you, if you're interested, I can discuss offline. Really a good use case is, I mean, your fabric is up and you have syslog as a sensor. And let's say you have a BGP flap or a link flap. That's when you, know, you want basically all the logic in a workflow around troubleshooting to start kicking in and saying, okay, I got this error. You parse the error, you parse the IP address. You realize that you know, it's some kind of a BGP error, which means most likely the switch is up. The workflow goes in, starts collecting information, just like how, and I've troubleshot personally, you know, large ISP networks yeah. with BGP, with MPLS. You know, whatever I would do as an expert, if I can capture those in a workflow in, the, in, in a way, and I think that's fantastic because that's reusable. 
that's kind of time predictable as well. So if my yeah. BGP architect leaves for Facebook, I'm not worried about, I'm worried about skills loss as well. So those are the, you're right, those are the event-driven things around troubleshooting, around you know, event-driven capabilities are the ones which are of more value. This is just a yeah. starting point for us. Okay, uh, this, this slide real quick shows you, so when we start provisioning the, so once the inventory is added, when we start actually provisioning through the workflow, all the switches actually are provisioned in parallel. So all these seven switches, what, will, what you will see is that, you know, interface is being configured, BGP is being configured, BGP EV, EVPN is being, being configured, all of them almost in parallel. So that's a point I wanted to highlight here. And when eventually everything is done, the workflow returns with, you know, basically a nice view of your BGP configs. And we are trying to update these and kind of, you know, make them more user intuitive because even as, as you get an ACK, you know, you want it to be like very simple because today if I were to show you a BGP output, it's gonna be state established, blah, 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 a lot of stuff, right? So just basically, you know, make it easy. And in the future, I mean, you know, from as we beef up validation, it's gonna get even better. Do you do anything with uh, WSB versus wiry uh, management, uh, what it should be versus what it really is? We, we are looking at that. So the inspect sort of inspect sort of things around what we configured, is it even working? So let's say I type router BGP, you know, or, um, you know does the BGP process even start? So we, we're yeah. thinking of all of those baby steps because that's what makes a certain Yeah, I'm just service. thinking like, like I have my own way of doing things yeah. and, and I'm, I'm following the, the parameters of the automation yeah. exercise yeah. that we have and then, you know, uh, you know, there may be somebody else on my team that does things the way that, do, that, they, that they do things up in Canada. Yeah. And they log into the switch and, and make hit the change, that, you know, separately from that process. It, it'd be interesting to see if that automatically remediated itself. Sure, sure. Uh, this is the template example. Again, you know, things that you've seen pretty much, how do I, you know, BGP settings like allow AS, you know, BFD parameters. These are optional parameters. The main parameters are the IP address range, the AS range, for the leaf and spine, so sort of. And the default template is the one which is there. Once you put these, you cannot change the AS numbers and the IP address. If you wanna change, you create a new template and associate all your switch with switches with the new template. So simple from that perspective. Um, let me quickly walk through the demo. I think you've seen a lot of this. So let's just walk through this video given that. So, so we start with, you know, basically, uh, you know, the fabric inventory for the default fabric. So as this is running, if any questions come to your mind, guys, please, uh, you know, I'm expecting more questions. If not, then I'll assume that the, the dessert did its, its work and everybody's kind of <laughs> really, really low on energy. So this command, we are actually adding the first switch. I just wanted to show you this command from the CLI, but this is for the first switch. The other six will be added via the Stackstorm UI. And you will see that's even quicker because right now, you know, just from a demo perspective, I wanted to take you backstage. Uh, so the switch is actually set up, all configured, and now we go to uh, uh, Stackstorm. So this is our NOS library. Uh, just one second. So this is our NOS pack. This is basically the PyNOS integration that goes in uh, Stackstorm and that talks to the switches essentially. Uh, and so when, when you see the different actions, or you can even uh, you know, run those commands, uh, the workflows from the history. The history kind of keeps a tab of whatever was run in the last whatever today, a you know, few days ago and so on. So from history, you can actually, the last command we ran on this Stackstorm CLI was the switch add, if you remember. So now we are just rerunning that command, changing the IP address and the password parameters for the next five or six switches. So simply, you know, as you do this, you know, another switch is being added to your inventory. So this thing kind of flashing shows you that the workflow is still running. If it's green, it's successful. If it's flashing, so it's done already. And you know, you can see some of the outputs where this, the role of this was a spine, but there is no BGP configuration. So I also have some, um, uh, you know, outputs from the switches themselves, you know, before and after the workflow, so there are no configs, and after everything is done, how you can see everything on the switches, which is working fine. Are you using something, uh, NetConf, to configure the switches? Yes. So let me just move uh, quick on these, as we are adding all of these five or six switches, so it's pretty much, you know, the same process based on the topology and the commands. So 
So I'll, you know, I'll, in the interest of time, because I think Patrick is going to start a countdown soon. Um, so this is when we get into the switch, each of these switches. And as you can see, there is no BGP configuration, anything added yet. The switches just were assigned <coughs> two back addresses. They were brought up. And now as we add some of these workflows, uh, basically, uh, you know, we will add the, you know, the main workflow which actually configures the entire fabric. That will start, as I showed you in that slide. And, and that workflow uh, right here. As you can see, this little thing points out that, you know, this is basically a more complex workflow. It has a lot of these different steps. So as we start running into this, as we run this workflow, all we need to do is to basically tie it to the default fabric. And once that is done, I think we're, uh, you know, we're good to go. And it will do all its magic. So as you can see now, this uh, workflow is running. It's flashing. It's going to spawn other workflows. So first, it's checking the inventory to make sure that you know, there are switches in this inventory. It's not just a bogus. Uh, and once that thing is done, it's going to spawn off basically multiple parallel configurations. Uh, so this is one, this is the other, and so on. And this will keep on going on for a while. What switches are supported again? Just the VDX. So this is, this is our, these, these, these would be our VDX switches. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, some of the newer platforms that we will come out with, we will also support those for the IP fabric. Uh, there are other use cases where we will also support our MLX fabric. So, you know, you know, we provide you capability to also automate other use cases. So is Workflow Composer really going to be targeted for brocade infrastructure solely? Uh, uh, so here's, uh, here's the answer for that, right? We want to go deep into event-driven for our platform first because the... Uh, because this is uh, NetConf and Yang based, if let's say a Cisco or a Juniper or somebody else who sub whose devices support net, uh, you know, these capabilities, they want to use Workflow Composer to automate, you know, then definitely someone can do it. I think the best possible would, scenario would be a partner or a customer who is a multi-vendor environment, which is typically the case to do it. The reason why I don't want to troubleshoot, and I, I mean, I, I come from Cisco, but <laughs> the reason why I don't want to troubleshoot a Nexus 9K is because I don't have access now to all of the intricate things of you know how I would you know look at conditions and, and deal with that. Well, what about open config? That's a good point. I mean, you know, we, we uh, initially I think you know we are looking at what our customers have deployed, what's the deployment base. But uh, you know, uh, as we you know as we get some interest in in that, then definitely we'll entertain that. <laughs> So as you can see here, essentially, I mean, th this is just walking you through the different switch states, right? So as the workflow runs, you know, different configs start popping on these switches. Let me just fast forward a little bit more. Oh. So now, uh, given that those fan out, that, you know, the big workflow which was fanning out to those seven switches in parallel, now that some of it is executed, you can see that the Gigi interfaces, the 10 Gigi interfaces and the IP fabric, the loopback interfaces, those have come up, right? So uh, that's basically, you know, one progress indicator. And then, um, one second, let me. <coughs> And now you will also see that uh, some of the BGP configs, you know, uh, and this is basically baseline BGP, BGP EVPN, uh, you know, uh, the whole, you know, o the, the prep work for your overlay provisioning, you know, that is all, all being put in there and, you know, that comes up at this point. <coughs> So right here, you can see the state is established. This is on one of the switches, right? So all of the other peers on this, you know, this is on one of the spines. So he can see basically all the other ASS things are coming up, right, from that perspective as the workflow is running. 
there are some switches will still which still need to kind of you know finish uh, the uh, the configuration. So I'll just move forward to kind of moving towards the end here. So sec. So this is interesting. So you can actually see your execution list if you're in the middle of a big workflow in terms of uh, what, you know, what has been executed and what remains out of that. So uh, as this command is run, you can see that everything else is, is finished except for the last one, which is basically now it's saying that now that the fabric is configured, uh, you know, so you can also go into this execution ID. This is the UUID of that. You can basically, if you want to probe deeper, you can see which component of this workflow is finished and which component is still running. So you can go at that granular level, especially for more complex workflows like this one. And I think by this time, by the time we ran this, everything was finished. So as we switch over to our, uh, you know, our uh, UI, you will see that, you know, this field actually becomes green as well. So let me just fast forward real quick. <clears throat> so these are all the switch outputs where the configurations, all of your states are validated for uh, BGP eVPN. And essentially here is where all of your workflow, workflows are complete. So your IP fabric with those seven switches is up and ready. An no, so BWC is an automation platform, right? So it runs, uh, uh, basically you can run it on a, you know, a, a Linux machine. And uh, you really don't need SDN controller because this is simply event driven. Uh, you're using obviously here the actions are based on netconf, but you know, in a generic sense, because you know, people use it for apps, for microservices, for DevOps. You know, it doesn't matter what you're using. So we are looking at different aspects. Obviously, that's a broader conversation. Uh, you know, uh, because uh, what we really have to look at is what are the areas where we bring automation. Right, automation can be brought to either even deploying an SDN solution from that to you know basically managing the life cycle of that SDN solution. So yes, and we are looking at different possibilities, just which use case we prioritize and go to market. So uh, what other use cases? Uh, so I, I can't help but feel this is maybe kind of a low impact use case, just yep. because auto provisioning is kind of uh, out there. Do you have any, any examples or, or what sort of use cases are you seeing this put to use for resolving issues? So if I have it, if uh, you know, more like auto, um, you know, uh, correction of, of, of incidents. Like, so if I have some some trigger, right, and I want to modify some parameter, uh, obviously I assume that this tool, it can be written to, to do that. Do you yes. have any use cases that you can show us around that or examples? Yeah. So, so, so for example, troubleshooting, right? In the area of troubleshooting for the same fabric, uh, if there's any connectivity loss, if there's any issues with, you know, BGP, uh, as you add, start adding tenants, you know, if there are issues with tenant connectivity and so on, I think that is one major area because you know, a lot of our customers are dogged by operations, right? They may not have the skills or these SLAs are unpredictable. So by automating some of these, A, we can actually solve this problem very elegantly wherever possible. And if it's a bug, then you know that integration with, you know, with DevOps or VictorOps uh, or, or PagerDuty allows you to log all the information and just open a trouble ticket, right? Uh, but I think the troubleshooting use case is very, uh, is, is I think very valuable. The the validation use case, which I think kind of precedes the troubleshooting use case, is also important because by by doing validation, you really can break down a complex, even a, pro, a simple protocol like BGP, which is running mu in multiple address families. You can break down on each one and basically say is something running or not. Because in order to really troubleshoot, you need to first be aware of your state in some sense. So those capabilities can be built with the workflows. And then, you know, wherever possible, remediation. So let's say you, like, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning, I have something that goes down and by just by, you know, flipping a line card, if it comes up, 
then you know I could bake it into this, right? I mean, I could turn my customers 2 a.m. conference calls into just you know 10 a.m. reviews in the morning, where it's like something went down, the workflow got triggered, and it got auto remediated. Everything is fine, but yeah, go and look at it while you're getting errors on your line card, for example. And you said, don't forget, uh, Lindsay's going to be up next, and he's yeah. going to show you some uh, automated remediation uh, use case. Not necessarily <laughs> networking specific, but he's got a pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think uh, Patrick's point was that uh, Lindsay is going to show you some remediation use cases. The other quick point I want to point out is it's not just about the network. As Dimitri talked about actions and workflows, a workflow is a component called rules. So when you get a certain trigger, the rule allows you to actually call multiple domains. So if a fabric goes down, <coughs> let's say you want to move a compute server from one part of the fabric to another. Maybe you could you know, write a workflow to trigger a vMotion or just you know, bring it up somewhere else, you know, things like that. Those, those sort of cross-domain capabilities are really, really the ones where I think you know, this can also make a big difference from an event-driven automation perspective. And then what platforms are officially supported then? So um, uh, from a brocade, I mean, so you know, VDX today, you know, uh, we're looking at MLX, we're looking at some of our newer platforms within Brocade. Uh, from a multi-vendor perspective, anybody who supports NetConf and Yang can write, you know, a, a, you know, a workflow. Uh, these guys have built sensors and uh, actions into, uh, you know, OpenStack, uh, you know, public cloud, AWS services, you know, uh, you know, Azure. So those are just some examples, you know, the, 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 the directory that Dimitri showed is basically rich with you know, all sorts of integrations, right? Somebody did an integration with FireEye from a cyber security perspective, right? So, so you can use pretty much all of these. And, and uh, you know, I've looked at automation systems in the past. The challenge has been, A, the sy automation systems have been static, and B, it's always been, this is great. How do I integrate 50,000 things across, you know, that I need to? So I think from the concept of sensors and actions and easily being able to integrate sensors, it's actually really good to see the community-based effort and you know, efforts within Brocade to kind of bring the <clears throat> velocity of integration at a much faster pace. So we will use the community, obviously. I mean, otherwise, you know, if you come to me and say, can you do this integration for something very unique, it's going to take us forever, right? And our domain is in networking. You know, our expertise is in networking. So your routing portfolio and WAN and... MPA. So, so we, we, will look at, we will look at those as well, right? I mean, you, because when we look at customer scenarios, they are holistic. They start from a data center, but let's say an internet exchange provider or a WAN scenario becomes, you know, because you're looking at a service. So we have to expand uh, definitely in use cases which are more holistic.